Okay, hi everyone, welcome to uh, this week's Sherpa free lesson. So this is going to be the sixth one that we've um, done. Planning on doing many more, so make sure you tune in every Thursday. Um, this lesson is going to be on maths graphs and it's going to be conducted by Ollie here. Um, brilliant Sherpa tutor, so make sure you go and check him out. Um, but that's enough talking from me, over to you Ollie. Thanks very much. Hello, everyone. Um, yeah, today we're going to do some graph transformations. Um, so I'll just bring up the whiteboard. Um, so yeah, I think a lot of the time um, <clears throat> when I'm when I'm kind of going through past papers and things, uh, graph transformations are one of the things that always crop up as an issue for people. Um, and also, you know, for anyone doing um, you know thinking of doing A level, they also come up at A level a lot. So it's always good to um, be confident on this now. Um, and also, you know, it's, it's a really useful tool to have in in, um, in your arsenal as well. So, um, you know, doing physics at, at uni, I was doing graph transforms all the time. Um, you unfortunately can't get away from them. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, so there's there's kind of three main um, three main aspects of graph transformations. So, um, if we look at the the transformations, transformations. We've basically got uh, translation, which is kind of you know as as you probably expect, it's it's moving. Um, that's probably not very clear. It's like scaling. It's moving kind of left or right, and it's moving up and down. Uh, we've also got scaling. So this is as you'd expect. It's kind of stretching in the y and stretching. In the x or, or compressing as well so you can also have that uh that kind of uh, effect and uh finally we've got reflections so this is always going to be as you say it's always going to be a reflection in the the y-axis or the x-axis so on a graph this would look um you know you'd either be kind of flipping through the y-axis or you'd be flipping through the x-axis um, like that. Um, <clears throat> the two main ones I'm going to focus on is translation and scaling. Um, and we're kind of going to work our way through a couple of examples. And uh, hopefully then we'll kind of derive two main uh, rules that we can then use. So once we've got these rules, um, hopefully you know we can just uh, apply the rules and we'll have a base understanding of why we're applying them. But any kind of transformation question we encounter, we can just apply these two rules and it will hopefully be much, much easier. So <clears throat> uh, let's start off with a, a quick example. We'll do a, a translation example. <clears throat> um, so I'll go on to a new page. And um, let's just do a very simple graph. Um, and we'll look at, slightly wiggly line, we'll look at the graph of uh let's do um y equals 2x plus 3 so it's going to look something like that so this is the graph of 2x plus 3 and obviously we have x axis and y axis here <clears throat> and if we uh you know if we were to plot a few of these actual points out um you know we could we could do a little table over here and we could have you know x and we'd have our function to x plus three. Um, and let's just go, I don't know, between like minus three and three. So we'll go minus three, minus two, minus one, zero, one, two, and three. And we'll, we'll look at what we get for, for each value of x. So, you know, as with any function, you, you plug in your value of x and it spits out a new value essentially. So um, if we look at plugging in our first number, minus three, well, we plug that into to x, we kind of take that and we put it into that value for x there. And what we end up with is two times minus three, which is minus six plus three, and we get minus three. Uh, do the same thing for minus two. I'll, I'll kind of gradually speed up as we go through. So uh, two times minus two is minus four uh, plus three, and we get minus one. And we can continue doing this for all the numbers, but you know, obviously it's a, a two x function. So just like, You've probably seen a similar thing with um, sequences before, except rather than x, you've seen n. Um, so we know we're basically counting up in in multiple in um, kind of jumps of, of two, aren't we? So uh, we know that one's going to be positive one, that one's going to be three, that's going to be uh, five, 
seven, and nine. And so these, these values basically correspond to, to the graph that I've, I've just drawn over here on the left-hand side of the page. <clears throat> um, you know, we could double check this, you know, obviously for zero, that point there is gonna be three. And you know, when we look at, when we intersect the y-axis, we could, you know, double check and we could say, well, what does X have to be for us to have a value of zero? And we know that we'd have to have uh, two times minus 1.5. Uh, plus three is going to give us zero. So that value there is going to be um, minus 1.5, 1.5. Right, so we've kind of got, you know, got our graph and we've got our values corresponding to a few points on the graph. Um, where do we go from here? So <clears throat> I'm just going to get rid of that, uh, that arrow there. Well, now we're going to look at a, a graph transformation. So we're going to we're going to look at translation first. <clears throat> so this um, <coughs> this original function, <clears throat> I'm going to call fx. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> I'm going to call fx, <clears throat> and um, I'm going to do a new function. I'm going to call it <coughs> f of x plus one, and we're going to see what happens. So what this, what this basically says is, says before you do anything else, add one to your x value. <clears throat> so this then becomes two times x plus one plus three. And we'll do the same thing again. So we're going to look at, you know, what happens if we then put on our values for x. So we'll put in uh, minus three first. And we get minus three plus one. Uh, we're obviously following bid mass, so we do brackets first. Uh, minus three plus one, and we get minus two. Times that by two, we get minus four. And then we plus three to that, and we get minus one. Uh, same thing again, we can put minus two into this new function, and we get minus two plus one is minus one. Times that by two, we get minus two plus three, we get positive one. And if we keep doing this, um, we can see we end up getting these values come up. <clears throat> and um, if we, you know, if we actually look at this and, and see what's going on here, we can see basically that we're kind of peering into the future, aren't we? So this minus one corresponds to this minus one, this one corresponds to this one. So what we're doing is for every value of x, we're actually plotting for the next value on from x. So as we work away, um, along the, the x-axis from minus three to three, um, <clears throat> we're actually kind of peering into the future and plotting that one instead. So we could look at what that actually uh, translates to on our graph. Um, I'm gonna do this in a, a new color. I'll go, I'll go green for this one. So this is, I'm gonna call this our, our green graph. Um, and what's gonna happen is our whole graph basically is gonna move one space uh, to, the left. So it's going to end up doing this. <clears throat> um, and, you know, we could uh, double check a few things again. So we could say, well, what happens when x equals zero? What's, what's going to be our y-intercept of this new graph? And we can put a zero into our fx plus one function. We can, we can basically put zero into there. Um, and we're going to get two times one, which is two, plus three, which is five. So I know at that point there, is five, which uh, kind of makes sense, right? We've kind of moved moved over to the left, and uh, we've you know, therefore we've kind of moved up our y-intercept. Um, and we could again look at look at this uh, intercept here. We could say, well, what does x have to be for uh, y to be zero? Um, and we can say, well, you know, what happens if we put in say minus two point five? That's going to go over us minus two point five. Uh, so we're going to put minus 2.5 basically in here. Um, we're going to get minus 2.5 plus 1 is minus 1.5 times 2 is minus 3 plus 3 is 0. So I know that point there is, I'm going to squeeze it in, squeeze it in over there. That point there is going to be minus 2.5. So that's that's a few of our um, few of our key, uh, key intercept points. <clears throat> so it's kind of counterintuitive though, right? So what you know what's happened is, We've added one to x, but we've actually um, moved to the left one. We've kind of moved down by one space. 
So all the points on our graph have moved back by one position. And this is kind of, you know, we're kind of uncovering the first rule here, which is if we, um, if we add one to the X, we essentially do the opposite of what we'd intuitively expect. Um, and you know, if we added five to this, we'd end up shifting down five positions to the left-hand side. Because you know, as, as we've seen, we basically, whenever we add one to X, what we're essentially doing is we're peering into the future. We're peering along the X axis ahead of ourselves as we kind of, as we kind of you know, work our way along the, uh, the X axis. So we're always kind of going from uh, negative to positive. You know, as we're as we're plotting these functions, essentially. <clears throat> um, so we could kind of you know summarize summarize this uh, this discovery, and you know we could say um, when we're inside the brackets, we know we change the x-axis. So we're going to say if it's inside the brackets, inside the brackets. And these are all, just to clarify, this is all uh, translations we're working on here. So we say inside the brackets, when we, you know, when we do add plus one inside the brackets, for example, we change the x-axis. So we, we kind of move along the x-axis, move along the x-axis. So I'll underline that. And it's in the opposite direction. direction uh, to what we'd to what we'd intuitively expect to oh, to what we'd expect yeah the number of the number of times you know I've kind of done this uh, with brand new students who haven't even looked at translations previously and they're all convinced that the graph should move up to the right hand side and it's only when you actually kind of plot the points out and you kind of then plot the graph that they uh, finally accept the fact that it's, it's actually the opposite of what they initially expected. So um, I'll underline opposite there. So that's kind of our first rule. So whenever we see something inside the brackets, uh, it's always going to be changing the x-axis and the opposite of what we'd expect intuitively. Uh, we can do another one now. So um, let's have a go at changing outside the brackets. Um, this is slightly nicer. Um, I'll just get rid of that arrow from earlier. So if we change outside the brackets, let's do um, let's look at f of x uh, minus four. Give myself some space. And again, so you know what's going to happen with our original function? You know, this is this is our original function up here. Um, if we look at how minusing four will impact that, well, you know we could do it in two goes. If I just move that over there. Um, <clears throat> So we'll end up with 2x plus 3. And then at the very end, we're going to minus 4 from our original function. And so that's just the same as 2x minus 1. So we're now going to look at you know, what, what values do we get when we plug in our x values from minus 3 to 3. And we're going to hopefully be able to then graph our function based on those points. So, you know, if we look at uh, minus three to start with, we get two times minus three is minus six, minus one is minus seven. Uh, two times minus two is minus two, uh, minus four, and then minus one is minus five. And again, you know, we've got a very similar setup to when you've probably done sequences in the past. We've got like a two, this is very similar to like two n. It's kind of analogous to you know, a two n function. Um, so uh, we know we're kind of you know jumping up in jumps of two. Um, so I can very kind of quickly fill in the rest of these. So we're going to have uh, minus three, minus one, one, uh, three, and five. So how does that then uh, work when we we go to plot that? Um, well, you know we could uh, draw the graph over here. So I'm going to use a different color again to keep things. Uh, mildly co coherent. Um, this is going to be my, my blue function over here. And um, you know, if I plot this graph, well, I know the, uh, the y-intercept, you know, when x is equal to 0, it's going to intercept the y-axis at uh, minus 1. 
And uh, I know it's still going to have a uh, a graph, uh, a slope or a gradient of positive two. So um, this is uh, sort of what my graph ends up looking like. And you know what we can actually see is um, happening here is um, you know if we just pick this uh, this random point here. Right, let me just see if I've uh, done this correctly. Uh, right, three minus four minus one. Uh, two x minus one. Yeah, that's all fine. Yeah, yeah. Um, so what's going on is you know any any points. You know if we if we compare our um, original points, um, you know we've got minus three up here and we've got minus seven down here. What we can see is we've actually subtracted four um, from every single y coordinate on our graph. And we can look at this minus one and we can see we've got minus five. And so every single point on our graph is kind of four less in the y direction. So everything, you know, any any random point has basically moved down by four places. You know, I could be at any any point in that graph, they've all moved down by four places. Um, <clears throat> and yeah, that's that's you know a kind of brief introduction of, of what happens when we change out when we kind of add a, a number or subtract a number outside the brackets. So you know we're we're outside the brackets when we when we minus that four from our original function. So we can say, you know, we can kind of summarize this and uh, we can say if it's outside the brackets, outside the brackets, we know we're going to move along the y-axis. Underline y. And you know, we're, we're minusing four and we're going down by four. So it's kind of what we'd expect, right? We're, we're not getting any uh, unusual things happening here. So we're going to be moving in the direction. Um, so it's in the direction we'd expect. We'd expect. And underline is, is what we'd expect. Um, so that's kind of you know brief intro to to translations. Um, and there are kind of two rules that we can now use in the future whenever we see a, a, an awful translation question. Uh, we can just remember these two rules: outside the brackets, it's x-axis in the opposite direction. Um, if it's inside the brackets, if it's outside the brackets, it's the y-axis, and it's what we would expect. Um, right. So we can go on now, and we can look at uh, scaling as well. Um, so I'll go on to a new page. And <clears throat> I think I'll probably I'll probably keep the same function to, to keep everything um, cohesive. So let's, uh, I'll just graph out my, my function from the previous page again. This is uh, 2x plus 3. And now I'll just uh, do a, a brief um, Zero, one, two, three. A very brief table again. And rather than adding or subtracting from our function this time, we're actually going to be multiplying by something. So, <clears throat> um, you know, if I just uh, rewrite down our f of x, um, our original function, which we, we call fx. Was, uh, I'll do read that. It's a slightly weird f. There we go. So this is this is what we're calling fx, our original function, and um, you know we can uh, plug in our values again. Uh, so we start off with uh, minus six plus three is minus three, and then uh, minus four plus three is minus one, and we can continue up again just like we did last time. Three, five, seven, nine, and so now rather than adding, we're going to do um, f of two x. I'll do, yeah, I'll do f of 2x. I might um, change my graph slightly because I'm actually going to shoot off up quite quite far. So I'm going to give myself a bit more space, I think, and, and do this uh, slightly smaller to avoid going off the end of the page. I'm going to do this further down and myself a bit of space. 
There we go. Um, right, so we can uh, we can start filling in these values just like we did last time. So <clears throat> what this is what this is saying, what this f of two x is saying is before we do anything, we we multiply x by two, and then we put it into our function. So this is the same as doing two times two x plus three which is obviously the same as 4x plus 3. And this is going to be our, our new function. This is, this is what uh, 2x, f of 2x is, is uh, representing. And, um, you know, we can start filling in values. So when x is equal to minus 3, we end up with 4 times minus 3, minus 12, plus 3 is minus 9. And same again, you know, when x is minus 2, 4 times minus 2 is minus 8 plus three is minus five. And just like I mentioned last time, you know, similar to our, our sequences, we, we've got a four X term here, haven't we? So we know we're essentially jumping up in multiples of four. So I don't need to, you know, do all these, all these uh, values, you know, I know exactly what's gonna go in this box here because I just add four every time. So I know I've got minus one and then three and then seven, and 11 and 15. Um, and we can now plot this on our graph. Um, and you know, if we have graph paper, you know, I might I might plot these out on graph paper. Um, for now, I'm just gonna do a, a very quick, a quick plot. Um, we know the gradient is gonna be four and the y-intersect is three. So we know it's gonna intersect at the same point as our original function does. Um, but if the gradient is four rather than two, um, we know it's going to be steeper. It's going to be kind of twice as steep. So it's actually going to look like this. Uh, and I'm actually going to use a, a different function as well. I'm going to call this my pink function. And uh, I'll graph it in pink. So this is for x plus 3, um, otherwise known as f of 2x, whereas my original function was just f of x. So again, this is kind of what we, what we would expect, wouldn't it? So, you know, if we're, um, if we're scaling um, in the x-axis, um, what, uh, what we end up doing is basically, um, scaling up by a factor of two, essentially. Um, <clears throat> another way of thinking of this is, you know, rather than um, kind of scaling up, what, what you know, it's, it's easy to get confused, right? So it's kind of what we'd expect in a way, you know, if, if we're comparing our gradients, we know this gradient is gonna be twice the, the size of the original gradient. So it's gonna kind of scale up in that direction, scale up in that direction. Well, I would encourage you to think about this more is rather than scaling in the y direction, what we're actually doing is um, we're kind of shrinking in the x direction. So this is this is the kind of you know keep keep on track with um, how we've been thinking about things so far. So what we can see is actually every x coordinate is shrinking by a, a factor of two. <clears throat> um, so yeah, I, I was uh, I would say again so. You know, if we're if we're plotting of f of two x, and we're shrinking by a factor of two, if we look at the previous page again and we look at our rules, it kind of makes sense with our rules, doesn't it? We know inside the brackets we're we're changing along the x-axis, and it's the opposite direction to what we'd expect, and it's the exact, exact same thing with scaling. So we change our um, x coordinates, and it is the the opposite to what we'd expect. Um, we can do the same thing again. Um, hopefully I've got time to, to finish this one off. Uh, let's look at the, the last version of this uh, scaling, which is scaling outside the function. Um, so let's look at uh, 2f of x. Uh, 2f of x. And what's, what that's the same as is we take our original function and at the very end, we multiply by 2. So I look at my original function, which is 2x plus 3. And I'm going to, at the very end, multiply by 2. So I'm essentially putting this in brackets. 
and at the very end, timesing it by T. And should have made these lines longer. Oh well. Um, and I can simplify this. Obviously, you know, I can, I, I can expand out these brackets, and what we get is four x plus six. And once again, um, we can uh, look at what we get. So, you know, if we were to um, plot a few of these values, um, or kind of, you know, work out the, the y coordinate of a few of these values, I can I put minus three into my new function. Um, and similar to the last one, you know, you get four times minus three is so minus 12. We're adding six this time. Um, so we get minus six. And same again, minus two times four. We can put minus two into here now. Times four is minus eight plus six is minus two. Um, you know, similar to last time, we can see we're jumping up in um, jumps of, of four. This is going to be two. This is going to be six. This is going to be 10, 14, and 18. And I can now plot this on my graph. So I'm going to call this my green function. And um, I know the, the y-intercept is going to be six, you know, just from looking at the, the y equals mx plus c. And you know, that, um, that I know the, there the y-intercept is, y -intercept is six. Um, so it's going to be intercepting up at this point here. Um, I might so, take this uh, graph slightly further up. Um, I might so, take this. Uh, <clears throat> And it's going to have the same gradient as my, my pink graph, isn't it? It's going to, they've both got gradients of four. So this ends up looking like, if I can draw this correctly, we'll see how it goes. <laughs> slightly, slightly iffy. All right, that'll do. <clears throat> and, um, what we can see in this case, if I you know, continue that down a little bit, what's actually happening here is every single um, point on my graph is actually being multiplied by a scale factor of two. So you know I can take um, you know I could look at the zero point first when when y equals zero at that the x intercept that point there, and Obviously, zero times uh, sorry, two times zero is zero. So we know that point stays the same. I could look at a point further down here, um, you know, say towards uh, minus three. Um, let me continue this down further. And this point here, we can see it goes down to that point there. And what the actual coordinates are, you know, if we look at when x equals minus three, we can see our original function had a uh, y value of minus three, and the new function, two f of x, has a y value of minus six. So that kind of makes sense, right? We, we actually look at every single point um, that we're plotting for. You know, we can look at minus one, that becomes minus two, one becomes two, seven becomes fourteen, and so on. So we can see every single y value is doubling, and that has the effect of basically scaling all the points um, centered on the x-axis because we know that anything times zero, so when x, uh, when we're in line with the x-axis, obviously y is zero, and anything times zero is just zero. So we know that point there is always going to stay in the same place, no matter how much we scale by. Um, but every other point, you know, I could I could pick this point here. This point here is going to become that point there. It's getting slightly crowded. Um, so I probably, I probably won't draw any more on that. I might, uh, I might draw it slightly further across. Uh, there we go. And so, you know, we could look at the point, this is maybe when, when X equals one at that coordinate there. And I know when X equals one with my original function, I have five. So that that coordinate there would be um, one five, and I can look at what the new coordinate becomes, and the new coordinate is going to be up here, and that coordinate, I know from looking at my my plots um, of the individual coordinates, is going to have a coordinate of ten, so it's going to be one 
10. So we can see that any, any point that we pick on our original function gets stretched in the y direction. Um, <clears throat> so what we're seeing basically is the rules that we, we found worked for uh, translating um, also work the exact same for scaling. Um, so that's why I've kind of chosen to mainly focus on translating and scaling for now. Um, reflect, I think we're near the end of the lesson. Reflections, um, just to see, you know, the last minutes. Uh, reflections are very similar, um, but they're 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 much easier. So reflections, if it's inside the brackets. Um, we're basically changing the x values. Um, <clears throat> so you know our our graph. You know I could I could draw any graph. Um, it could be say like that. Um, and if it's inside the brackets, inside brackets, we end up with that. Oh, we end up with that. And if it's outside the brackets, we're changing the values of y because we're doing it after we've um, already kind of got our uh, function outside brackets. I'll do the same graph again. We flip in, so that's that's the kind of flip in the in the y-axis. We end up flipping like I'll try and try and get this correct. And we end up flipping all of our coordinates like that instead. Um, <clears throat> but I went I went on too much on reflections, but I just want, wanted to mainly cover um, translations and uh, scaling. So this this uh, this whole page was scaling. Uh, right, I think we'll probably leave it there. Um, any any questions from anyone at all? the view here we go okay um yeah we've actually got a couple of questions i think i'll just start off let me just bring them up here um we'll start off uh, i'm going to ask you this question i ran a poll uh during that just wanted to find out some interesting stuff um and the poll i ran was which axis do you prefer and the results are in um we have <laughs> 33% of people saying they prefer the x-axis and 67% of people saying they prefer the y-axis. So, Ollie, first question, which axis do you prefer, x or y? Um, <clears throat> I think, I think y is too obvious. You know, I think, um, a bit of intrigue is, uh, is always good, good in maths. You know, you don't want to, you don't want to be stuck on easy questions all the time. So <laughs> I'm going to go, I'm going to go x. I'm going to go with the, the minority. Very diplomatic answer. I like it. Okay. So, <laughs> Now onto the proper questions. Um, so we've got one question here, which is how do you find the formula of a graph if it is already plotted? How do you find the formula of a graph if it's already plotted? So <clears throat> um, I could go on to, I'll go on to a new page actually and we can we could go through briefly how this would work. So you'd probably see it plotted on graph paper because um, we, we basically need to um, have two points to, to work out the formula for a graph. So, you know, um, Let's say we've got a graph that looks like uh, looks like this, right? And we've got this point here on our graph paper. Um, yeah, we might go down by two squares, for example. So this this uh, this corner would be um, zero minus two. And on our graph paper as well, you know, we might see we go across um, four positions here. So we could have kind of four ticks here. And so that that point there would be uh, four. Zero, and so <clears throat> we always need we always need two points on our on our line to to work out the the kind of the function of the graph. Um, so once we've got these two points, um, there's kind of two things we have to do. Well, you know the standard um, standard equation for a straight line, if we're if we're focusing on straight lines for now, is y equals mx plus c. Um, c is going to be oh, that's a slightly weird arrow. C is our y intercept y-intercept, and m is our gradient. 
So the wine intercept is the easiest one. So I'll start with that one. Um, the y intercept is, you know, just what's the value of y when we intercept the y-axis. And if I use a, a different color, um, this here is going to be our y-intercept. So that is going to be our value for c. Um, so kind of halfway there, right? We, we've, we've now got um, y equals mx minus 2. But we still need to find out, you know, what is m? So M is uh, slight, slightly more work. Um, M is, well, M is our gradient, right? So our gradient is defined as, gradient is defined as the change in Y over the change in X. Change in Y over change in X. And the reason this is the case um, is, you know, obviously if the change in Y is much larger, if we increase the change in Y, that means the gradient is steeper. So, you know, if I was to plot uh, another graph that looked like that, it would mean that, you know, as I, as I move along one in the x-axis, rather than moving up by a half, for example, we, we move up by two or three. Um, it's, it's mostly easy to think about this. You know, normally when you, when you calculate a gradient, um, especially on graph paper, you can just set your change in x to be one. Um, and so really our gradient is just how much do we move up in the y direction um, as we move along each square in the x direction. So in this case, you know, we've got we've got two points. So we can work out our change in y and change in x. Um, the change in y, I mean, obviously, uh, just to clarify, the the y is given by the, the second number in our coordinates. Um, so we can work out the, the change. We're going from, you know, if I if I pick this is uh, I'll use a different color. Let's say this is um, coordinate A and this is coordinate B. And I'll do I'll do A minus B, right? So we're doing zero minus minus two. So my change in Y is going to be positive two. And if we then look at the X change, so again, I'm going to now look at the first two numbers. Um, we then say, well, you know, we're doing um, a minus b again. We're doing four minus zero, so we end up with four as our change in x. And we know that, you know, if we then if we then wanted to simplify that, um, two over four is the exact same as one over two. So my gradient is one over two. So I can I can now rewrite my my function as y equals one over two x minus two for, for this graph. Brilliant. Okay, um, and so another question is, why do sin, cos, and tan also appear in graphs? I thought it was just for trigonometry. So I think they might, might be a little bit further ahead in the book, um, but you're still happy to answer that one? Why do sinks and tan appear in like the graphs questions? If you you know if you do kind of a graphs worksheet, you get sinks and tan. Um, I mean, you know, they're they're just graphs, same as everything else is a graph, right? So sine is a graph, cos is a graph, tan is a graph. Um, rather than graphing, um, you know, y equals I don't know, x squared minus five, for example, we we can also graph y equals sine x, or you know, we could graph y equals root of x plus seven. These are all just graphs. Um, I think the, the confusion may be is that, you know, kind of sine is its own function. So, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to go into like too much what sine actually represents, but, you know, if you, if you remember your Socatoa, Socatoa. Well, that's throwing it back for me, I have to say. I couldn't, somehow <laughs> that's awakened. I remember that. <laughs> my, um, <clears throat> my aunt is a math teacher and she used to say it's, She's slightly on PC. She would say it's, uh, it's a Japanese swear word, but um, <laughs> uh, it's, uh, it's one way I'm remembering it. So uh, Sogatera, in, in our case, um, we're going to be using our sine triangle. Um, so, you know, this, this basically tells us sine x is equal to the opposite length over the hypotenuse length. Um, that's all sine x is, you know, so, you know, if I, if I draw out a couple of triangles and I wanted to you know look at you know what what's happening here 
Well, if, uh, if we call, if we call this X, um, all sign is telling us is, well, what is the ratio of the opposite to the adjacent, uh, the hypotenuse? So this is my opposite because it's you know, literally opposite the, you know, if I imagine drawing a line of symmetry on my triangles, it's opposite the uh, line. Um, and then my hypotenuse is just the, the longest of the, the three lines or it's opposite the, uh, the right angle. Um, and so we know when X is small, um, O over H is also going to be small. You know, this could be if X is, um, I don't know, say 10 degrees, we know O over H is roughly going to be, uh, I don't know, could be, um, so it's kind of a small number over a big number, right? So it's, it's maybe one over eight or something. It could be, it could be roughly 0 0.1. We can do the same thing again. You know, if X is say, uh, 45 degrees. Um, we can say what's what's o over h in this case. Well, that's roughly going to be um, maybe one over 1.5, something like that. Um, so we could call this, uh, you know, slightly over half. We could be maybe like 0.7 or something. Um, and then when x is much larger, you know, when x is maybe um, 80 or 90 degrees. Probably, probably closer to 80 degrees here. Um, then we know uh, O over H is, is going to be approaching one, right? O, o is basically the same length as H. So we'll say O over H is closer to one. It's maybe 0 0.9. As that's all, all sign does, you know, we can then plot this. We can plot for 10 degrees and we can plot for 45 degrees and we can plot for 80 degrees. Um, and that's going to be 90 degrees there. And what we end up with is we end up with a... Uh, relatively small number first, and um, we get um, a plateau, right? Because we can see by the time we're at 45 degrees, um, that's probably not the best line, but by the time we're at 45 degrees, we're already kind of 0.7 of the way towards hitting that that maximum one there. Mm -hmm. So that's all, uh, that's all sine x is. It is just another function, just the same as if we were to plot you know, x squared or something. Um, it just has a, a different shape. Excellent. Okay. Um, we've got. Oh, we can use one more question. Um, I can choose. I mean, I can let you choose which one you want to answer. I think they're both. Well, one of them is more sensible than the other one. Let's talk about that. Um, so the unsensible one is where did the terms x and y come from? I have okay. no idea, so you, you can choose to answer that one if you want. Um, or why are quadratics more confusing than straight line graphs? But I would assume it's very similar to um, you know, the question you just answered there. Um, well, I can. I mean, I can do the first one very quickly. I have no idea. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't think many. But I don't think anyone something. does really. Do they? Yes, we had to pick something a while ago, and we just decided on X and Y. Um, it kind of, yeah, I mean, you know, you can also use i, j, and k. That's another way, uh, you know, when you start working with quaternions, if you do maths at uni, you'll use i, j, and k. Um, and, uh, you know, you can, this is only one coordinate system, so we have multiple coordinate systems. So we're doing with a, with a, a kind of 2D Cartesian coordinate system. You can also have, say, cylindrical coordinate systems. So rather than x and y and z, um, you basically set up your axes and then you imagine kind of a cylinder here and you can go up and down. You can kind of go up and down this, this Z axis. And then you have an angle that you define that, that puts you onto um, this surface. And then you also have a, uh, a length that you define that, that tells you how big your, um, your cylinder is. So if I, if I increased the radius of that cylinder, I would then be able to define a knee point in space further out. Um, so this, you know, this cylindrical coordinate system would use um, a Z and then it would use um, an angle, we call that angle theta. And then it would use um, a length and we'd call that length R. So X, Y, and Z are not the only letters that we use. We use, you know, Z, theta, R or I, J, K, or um, you can use, um, you know, if you have like a spherical coordinate system, uh, you'll end up using theta, rho and psi um 
So there and R. So you know, there's a there's many different coordinate systems and many different layers. Um, it's not just X and Y. <laughs> excellent. Okay. Um, I think we'll leave it there. That was excellent. Thank you very much, Ollie. Um, everyone watching out there, um, make sure you go and check out Ollie's Sherpa profile. He's ready to have some lessons. Um, you know. As soon as possible, I think. Um, so yeah, make sure you go and um, show him some love, have some sessions with him. Uh, as you can see here, he, he definitely knows his stuff, um, and it's not just graphs he does. He does a lot of maths. Um, so if you're yeah. struggling with maths, make sure to go and check out Ollie. Um, if you're looking for maybe another subject, so English, science, design and technology, whatever it may be, um, head onto the Sherpa website. We've got tutors in various subjects, pretty much every subject at every level from primary all the way up to degree. Um, and if you're still unsure and can't find the tutor you're looking for on the website, make sure you give one of our tutor experts a ring on 01628 337 590, and they'd be happy to help you out and try and find you the right tutor. Um, I'll let Ollie wrap up and say bye, and then, yeah, see everyone at the next one. Uh, yeah, thanks for watching everyone. Um, I hope it was mildly helpful. Um, and uh, those two rules are going to definitely come in handy. Um, so inside the brackets, it's X and the opposite to what you'd expect. Outside the brackets, it's Y and it's what you'd expect. Um, yeah, feel free to give me a shout if you want to arrange an initial meeting or, you know, first lesson or, um, you know, if there's anything I can do to help at all. Um, I also do physics as well if anyone's interested in physics. So, um, yeah, hopefully see some of you over on the platform. Brilliant. Cheers, everyone. Bye. Bye. Right.